everyone. Welcome to episode 12 of SAS Leaders Lounge. And today we're joined by Dr. Els van der Berg. Hi, how are you doing? I'm, I'm great, grateful to have you on the show and would love just for you to give us a bit of an overview of yourself. Sure. Thank you for having me on the SAS Leaders Lounge. I'm, uh, this is quite a good lounge to be in, I think. Yes. Um, yeah, so my name is Elsa. Um, I um, have been in tech for a little over 10 years uh, and in product management since uh, 2016. I have not been faithful to product management, so I've kind of swaved to all kinds of different departments. Um, and this is also something that kind of uh, makes up my personality. Um, I'm not the most straight-lined product managers in the world. Um, I am very curious, and it's very hard for me to stick to my lane. Um, and this also, I, I write a uh, blog um, on, on Substack, which is my name, elsafunderberg.substack.com, and I call it a Product Pori for the reason that it's kind of like a potpourri. It's a, a lot of product, but it's also marketing and sales and growth and leadership and everything um, because I am notoriously bad at sticking to my lane. So I think uh, that's the most important stuff to know about me. And what what I really find interesting is given your your various different roles at some of the you know top startups in Europe at the moment and, and also the US, I'm really keen just to understand First of all, how that interest into technology came about um, and when you really realized that product management was something that you really wanted to, you know, dive, dive into really deeply. So to be honest, um, it wasn't as much the technology aspect, but more the pace and the environment of tech companies and in particular tech and startups and scale ups. So the first time I kind of wandered into tech was very random. I was um, doing my master's in law here in Berlin, Germany, um, and I kind of just needed money. And a friend of mine was working at a scale up called Pay11, now called SumUp, and said, hey, they need uh, Dutch people, which is me, who can answer the phones and speak Dutch. So I kind of just walked in there um, and really, really liked it. I really loved the pace of this kind of fast, startup y scale up environments of people um, being super motivated, super energetic, um, caring a lot what we're working about, uh, strict deadlines, working hard, kind of the startup Kool-Aid, which I, I drank very much. Um, and for me, this was amazing because before that I worked in law, I worked at public prosecution when I was like 19, 20, and I thought that work was very boring. And then I started working in this startup and I was like, wow, this is so much fun. I really, I really enjoyed it. So it was not as much the technology aspect of it, um, but more the, the kind of teams, the pace of it, the learning, the curiosity, um, the, the cross-departmental work that you get to do. Amazing. And I guess SumUp is, is a company I've come across quite a few times on my bank statement, to be honest, because I know them to be kind of a payment um, solution, right? So a lot of businesses are using them for on-the-go payment uh, solutions. And when you was, you know, taking that first role in in a startup or scale up, as it was, where you was answering the phones, did you ever imagine you would, you know, move into product management at that point, or was it still very much, you know, just getting to to grips with how fast paced the environment was? I never really planned to go into product management. It always kind of, things kind of happened to me randomly. And later on in my career, I figured out I should be a bit more intentful about my moods. Um, however, the random style did work out for me in the beginning. Um, so I didn't plan this per se, um, but at some point I realized that I really like being able to zoom out and getting this kind of high level view of what is going on so I didn't like only being in the nitty gritty of it. So being super detailed, but I like to always take a step back and think about, does this make sense with regards to where we really want to go as a business? Um, what does the market look like? What are the competitors doing? Um, what other verticals are there that we haven't explored? So asking these kind of bigger questions. Um, and since this was something I always found interesting, I kind of wandered into venture architecture for a while which uh, means in, in this context meant building um, companies with corporates. Um, and then I figured out that you can kind of, you can do this in product as well, right? If product is done well, um, this is a really like the cornerstone of doing product well, um, which is why it was a very good fit for me. And 
for me, I, I was really, you know, keen to bring you on this show. And, and one of the reasons was because when I look back at a lot of the companies which I've helped to, to build um, within their recruitment teams, of course, there's been a lot of focus on product. And even when I talk to, you know, pre-sales leaders, custom success leaders, CEOs, there's always a tie into product, right? There's always an important factor where everyone needs to focus on product-led growth. And that leads me to a question that I really wanted to dive in with yourself, which is from your perspective, how are startups really able to identify the ICPs and really drive that product-led growth? So um, I just want to make clear that the differentiation between being product-led and product-led growth, right? Because these are very, very different things. Um, so not every company needs to go for product-led growth at all, right? Yeah. Also, not every company needs to be product-led. Um, it's, it's, um, I like working in companies that are product-led, but it's not must-have. A lot of companies are sales-led, and that works well for them as well. Um, product-led is more about um, the discovery practices, the delivery practices that you apply. And product-led growth is much more about using the product as the main driver for growth. So for customer acquisition, activation, retention, and all of those sweet things. Um, so they're very different things. Um, going back to your question about, sorry, can you repeat the, the last part of the question? So for me, it was just really about understanding when you're in an organization, you're tasked with driving you know, the product team. How are you able to really identify the ICPs and more importantly, right. how, how are you driving that product led growth within those organizations? I guess you would have had those discussions with, you know, executives in the business and they've identified that's the kind of, you know, growth that they're yeah. going to adopt and therefore felt right. that you was the right person to. So I, I thank you for asking that question because I think thinking about the ICP or the target audience segment that you want to serve is something that a lot of companies kind of gloss over or jump over at first. Um, and it's a very, very important question. And it's not just a question that's important for marketing. It's a question that is important for the whole business, right? And, and also very much for product, um, because it's very hard to build an outstanding product if I do not know who it's for. Um, but it's also a super difficult question for companies uh, to answer, because especially in the early stages, they don't really know yet, right? They have maybe some idea of who might, like... Uh, uh, who, the, who the value proposition might resonate with or who might benefit from the value that they're offering. But they don't really know yet for sure, right? Like it's a, it's a lot of hypotheses, a lot of assumptions. Um, so I work a lot with companies on trying to figure this out at the best way possible, depending on the maturity stage where they are at. Um, so when it's super early stage companies, it's about writing down these assumptions and understanding who that might be. And if it's about later stage companies um, that maybe have... 100 uh, customers in the case of B2B to fall back on. I think this is a very good time to kind of take stock of who is there and try to uh, detect patterns, try to kind of put them into cohorts, into segments and understand, okay, what kind of companies or what kind of personas have been coming to our solution and what's the connective tissue between these and what is the situation that they were all stuck in before they found us and what is what, what core value do we offer to them? And so I think this is super important to understand and especially in tandem with a PLG motion, as you say, um, because uh, product led growth is very, very difficult to get right um, because you need the product to take over all of these functions that humans used to do quite, quite well in a sense, right? So we used to have a sales agent um, who would do a demo call, who would speak to a prospect face-to-face -face and ask them, what is is troubling you right what are you trying to do here what is your what is your issue and then they would hopefully listen quite well and take that information and put it into a sales pitch so have a pitch that fits seamlessly to the problems that the customer has discussed um, and this would help them close the deal um, and now we don't have that person anymore right so just talking now about acquisition and activation so all of a sudden we need to the, the product to do this so the product needs to potentially know which questions to ask and how to interpret those questions and how to now spit out a demo or a walkthrough that fits seamlessly. Um, and this is very difficult to get right. And it takes a lot of iteration and a lot of experimentation and also a lot of discovery, a lot of talking or shadowing um, your customers to try to figure out 
um, who they are and, and what, what you should be asking, what you should be showing, what you should be doing in the products. So, um, yeah, good question. Amazing. I, I, I'm glad you liked the question. For me, another question that I wanted to dive a little bit deeper, because I guess, especially in B2B sales and, and software in general, customers are at the forefront, right, of everything successful. So when you are, you know, creating FAQs and doing customer surveys, or, you know, the, the, the product teams are getting feedback from, you know, the sales and customer success, how hard is it to really kind of aggregate all of this information and decide what's actionable and what features could be implemented into new products. This is very, very hard, right? So if you're in this luxury PM position that all of your colleagues keep throwing ideas at you and say, oh, our customers want this, our customers want like this, here's another trove of information. Um, firstly, this is great because, wow, people are interacting with you and you have a lot of data, but also this is terrible because you will be that PM who's just trying to get a cup of coffee at the coffee machine and there will be five people harassing you with, with feature requests that need to be live by next week. Um, and it is your job as a product manager to figure out which of these things you should be doing. And so I think what is the number one piece of advice is to understand what is the underlying need beneath any requests. So try to dig underneath. Um, and the issue is that these people that you mentioned, right, sales, customer support, whatever, it's not their job necessarily to dig for that underlying need. So you might be lucky and they might be able to do that and willing to do that besides their own job of actually solving the customer request, right? Um, but this is why product managers, product people should be speaking to customers ourselves um, because it's a special technique. Right. So there, there's there's you should absolutely never disregard all of the information that your colleagues are giving you, um, but they will not be digging for the underlying need as much as you would be as a product person. That's why it's very important to do your own research as well um, with selected target customers, selecting the target audience that you want to talk to, to um, find the answer to a specific question that you might have instead of being much more reactive with incoming requests. Um, so you shouldn't disregard it definitely use it but understand um what it is right take it for what it is it's submitted in a specific context uh a lot of other people might not be submitting that um and it's already very solution oriented and less problem oriented which is where you want to be and in your opinion from the different startups that you've helped and, and worked and advised i know it's pretty popular in today's climate, I guess, that especially for startups, they have, you know, interim or fractional product leaders. In what ways do you think are the key differences of or, or approaches that product leaders tend to have? And how does that, you know, conflict sometimes with the executive team of the vision that they have versus maybe what the execs outside of product may think may be the best direction to move in? Okay, so there's a pretty loaded question, right? Do you want yeah. to talk more about the fractional thing or more just in general, what happens if the product lead has a different opinion from the CEO? I, I would say the fractional piece is probably going to be the main focus because in every organization, there will be you know different opinions, of course, and it's about trying to align which ones work. All right, I don't fully understand how it has to do with the role being fractional or not. No, just in terms of the interim role, then I'm saying it, when somebody comes in as an interim or fractional leader, how is their vision then, you know, what, what, what timeline do they have to kind of implement their vision generally in, 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 in timeline? All right. Okay. Okay. So I think generally the product vision and the product strategy and the product roadmap, but let's start with the product vision. It's something that is owned by the product lead, but that doesn't mean they should be crafting it solo, right? Yeah. By their, or pushing it through solo. So I'm a big fan <laughs> of co-creating with, um, with your colleagues, right? With customers, but also with your colleagues. Um, so I don't really believe in pushing through as an interim product lead, my product vision, against the CEO, right? Like if there is a big um, difference in opinion with the the founders or with the CEO uh, or with any member of the leadership team that has an important stake, um, I would not push through my will um, 
because I believe it's just the truth, right? But really try to understand why do we believe different things? Where does this come from? Um, understand the context, why that is, and see um, what is happening here, right? Because we might just have a very different understanding of the market. Um, so I'd spend a lot of time in trying to figure out what is going on there. Because it would be very interesting if um, the founder and me have a completely diverging view of the product vision. And, and this is problematic because I believe in disagree and commit um, in a lot of instances, but probably not the product vision because this is such a cornerstone of what you're trying to do. Um, I would see that as, as wildly problematic. Um, so not as much trying to bend somebody else's will, but try to figure out um, why we are differentiated and see what is underlying um, that split. And for me, a, a question I, I want to ask you then is how challenging is it for you and your experiences of trying to tie the product's value to the needs of the customer? So this is super important, I think. So this is this, are you asking about the connection between? Yes things that are important for the business, like revenue, growth, et cetera, and things that matter for the customer. Yes, I think this is extremely important because um, we see both things, right? We see, see some companies that are optimized for um, business metrics, for growing revenue, et cetera, um, but don't create get great products for customers, right? So, so it's, uh, it goes against the customer's best interest. But I also see companies that have created this wonderful product that customers totally love, but they really don't have a way of turning a profit with it, which is also problematic. So I think this is a super important thing that you pointed out. Uh, and there are a bunch of ways to kind of mitigate that. Um, I think product managers need to be trained to get better at this. Um, in the past, we have become uh, delivery managers very much or requirements engineers, so very much pushed to um, pushing releases and just pushing out features, but not as much taking this bigger picture view and understanding, okay, are these the right ideas to prioritize because they both serve a customer, which in turn should serve our business. Um, so I think that's the relationship, right? We have a business metric on top, something that serves our business. For example, grow revenue, grow market share, reduce operational costs, uh, what have you. Churn rates. Uh, and below that, exactly retention whatever and below that we have a product metric i'm just stealing this directly from teresa torres i would never pretend that these ideas are mine um but i think she's her thinking is is very good on this um so below that we have product metrics which are uh, signifies changes in human behavior things that our customers or our users or whatever are doing um which are kind of pushing very likely this business metric um and these product metrics ideally correspond to the customers getting some form of value out of our product. Um, so I think by connecting these two layers and then connecting opportunities to this product layer um, and then collecting solutions to those opportunities, we can very nicely create this link all the way up um, and also understand very clearly which success, success metrics we should be looking at to see if our efforts are actually um, giving us what we want them to give us. And, and do you find that success metrics wildly differ from company to company or the foundations remain the same but there may be you know there will always be some that are different but the foundations tend to be pretty similar they differ they're different um they're different and also like there's a, there's success metrics and there's product outcomes and business outcomes that you're going for right so i have yeah. Um, there's, there's a product outcome that I'm trying to achieve in general, but below that I will be testing a hypothesis for which I will set different success metrics and say, okay, if, if these things are true, if these boxes are ticked, then the experiment is a success. So that can be if, uh, seven out of 10 of my, uh, prototype testers of my, of my, of my users are clicking this button, then it's a success. Um, so this is um, almost a traction metric, the success metric, which is not the same as the product outcome yeah. that I'm trying to achieve in the long run. And and from following you and, and looking at a lot of your posts, I guess it's very clear that you're somebody that champions uh, experimentation and you know exploring the wider product toolbox. And in your own words, I just want to understand you know what that means for you and how that allows product leaders the scope and the freedom to really build something great if they have that toolbox at their disposal. Yeah, absolutely. So this is something that I've seen at 
a bunch of companies, right? So I've in the last year, I've seen a lot of companies <laughs> um, because I've been freelancing and advising. So I've been in, in a lot more companies. Um, and I see this pattern that product teams are comfortable with one or two tools from the toolbox. Um, so in early stage companies, this tends to be maybe interviewing or shadowing. Um, in big, bigger companies that have a lot of data, um, yeah. that tends to be A-B testing. Um, A-B testing has also been heralded as the gold standard of experimentation, um, which is something I fight against <laughs> um, because I think there is no such thing as a gold standard. I think, as you say, we have this toolbox with a variety of tools, much more than these two. Um, I actually wrote a guide, um, which is also um, partially based on Steve Blank's book on discovery and validation methods, um, which has like 40 uh, research methods that you can apply. Um, and each of them have their own pros and cons, right? And each of them can be applied in different situations. Um, in general, a good rule of thumb is that when your hypotheses are still very unsure, when it's super risky, you should go for the most lightweight test, right? Um, so that you can learn as quickly and cheaply as possible um, and kill off your idea very quickly um, and then kind of move up as you progress. And a second rule of thumb is, of course, that you shouldn't have one test for each hypothesis, but ideally multiple tests, because one test might give you a false pocket positive or a false negative. Um, so if you just do it with one test, it's probably not reliable. Um, and another issue, of course, is that, for example, A-B testing, which is quite popular, a lot of teams run A-B tests and then afterwards are kind of left with a so what because they will have run a test and either it's statistically significant or it is not and either it's a success or a fail and they will look at this and go like but why and, and yeah. what is now next right they don't really know what to do next um, and here again I think the combination with qualitative data with customer discovery or with prototypes or usability testing etc makes it much more powerful um, so one of the things I try to do is make teams aware of this big, shiny toolbox that they have um, and try to get them also more comfortable with different research methods and understand which is a good fit for which situation. So understand that there's more than just one. And, and is there any research methods that you found particularly, you know, valuable for the companies? You, I know each company is different, but is there of the list of different, you know, options, is there any that stood out that have been pretty valuable for you and, and for organizations? Yeah, so it depends a little bit on um, what you're trying to do, right? Yeah, <laughs> um, Like what you're trying to learn, like, but for in terms of discovering new ideas or new unmet needs, right? For me, ideas have to correspond to an, an ideally unmet need. Um, so really when it's kind of green field, trying to figure out what should we do next, yeah. um, I quite like shadowing. Um, and also remote shadowing, because I think what you want to do is get some kind of cadence, so do quite a lot of discovery. And also another thing I see most companies do, big and small, is that discovery becomes this sprint that they do once every six months. So once every six months, we do five interviews or 10 interviews and then nothing. Um, yeah. And again, I'm repeating Teresa Torres, but it's really worked for me as well. It's very good if you get a cadence into this and if you do this continuously. But it's hard to do that, right? Because it takes time. Um, so what I quite like to do, what I've done before is ask, um, so, so give specific customers. So think about who do I want to involve in this uh, specific test uh, and give them a simple task to do um, either in my product or outside of my product, depending on what I'm trying to learn um, and ask them to film themselves while they do this and talk me through their thoughts. Um, and this is done async. I'm not there, it's unmoderated. So they can do it whenever they have time. They don't have to yeah. book any call. Whenever they have a moment, they just use QuickTime or whatever they have and they just record themselves talking through it. And if you give a pretty good assignment, this can be quite helpful and you can bang out quite a few. You'll get 10 minute videos instead of an hour long session. And you can look through them at your own leisure. So I think what I'm I'm quite pragmatic, right? So I try to do something that I can actually do continuously, that is cheap, that is easy, that users are willing to participate in, um, that I'm able to keep up with. Um, so this is something that has worked quite well for me in the past. It won't work in every situation, right? In some cases, you'll need to do something else. Um, but I think that will work quite well. 
Um, and in terms of validation, I think um, not all companies have A-B testing tools and A-B testing things set up. I work with a lot of early stage startups as well as scale-ups, scale but the early stage startups don't usually have that. Um, and there, I'm a big fan of um, setting up basic product analytics. Um, there are a lot of nice tools out there nowadays that make it simple, even for people who aren't great with data, like myself, shamefully. Um, so there's a bunch of tools that I really like using that give you insights out of the box, um, basically about funnel reports where are users dropping off, which kind of um, helps you identify success gaps, especially if you pair this with industry benchmarks. So you know what you're kind of expecting to see here. And then you see, oh, ooh, this is not looking very good. So you kind of know where to focus. Um, and, and also um, feature adoption and engagement metrics, I think, are very good. And for, for the audience listening, is there any uh, hints you want to give to any of these analytical tools that could be useful for product leaders out there that maybe want to you know, use these tools to better see how their products being utilized by the customers? Yes. I mean, there's a variety of things, right? So it depends also, again, at what you want to do. So I've, I've been through this process a few times and like selecting the right tool and setting it up from scratch. Um, and where I usually begin is understanding what questions are we trying to answer with data? So I kind of built this exhaustive, not quite exhaustive list, but a list of questions that you could be trying to answer. Um, and I sit with the leadership team and try to force rank these to figure out, okay, let's not go in with, we're going to try to get a 360 degree of our customer, but let's be super specific about what do we really want here? Um, and you have very, very, like varying things because some people really want to merge marketing data with product data. So they want to see, okay, where do specific customers come from? Which content have they consumed that turn into retained customers? This is a very different tool from a tool that does just in-product analytics. And I also work with a couple of companies who also want to redo their onboarding a lot. So they want to constantly be changing their onboarding flows and do in-app surveys and pop-ups and then also have basic analytics on the side, not the super shiniest analytics, but basic stuff. And um, for them, you have uh, UserPilot, Pendo, AppQs, right? So you have players that are specialized in this. If you really want to focus on um, analytics, um, if you want to focus on, on PLG and PLS, I would recommend journey.io. Journey is very good at um, integrating with all kinds of CRMs. Like they're super good at integrations. They have all these automations and they're really good at telling you Okay, in this account, there is a potential buyer now. It's time to pick up on this uh, qualified lead and do something. Um, and for analytics out of the box, um, especially in B2B, I quite like June. Um, June is very good at um, both user and account level analytics, which traditional, traditional providers like Mixpan or Amplitude can also do, but it's slightly more complex to set up. Um, June has worked quite hard to make that very easy. Um, they also have this um, natural language SQL query thing. Um, so I think there's a variety of really cool tools out there. Depends very much on what you're trying to do um, and what is important to you, what is good for you. Um, but you can always reach out to me on LinkedIn if you have questions about this, because I've done my fair share of research on this topic. I'm, I'm sure a few people will be reaching out in the coming weeks and months. And something... Having worked on a CPO role recently, something that um, was often a, a topic of discussion is finding leaders that, you know, are able to validate assumptions, hypothesis, and more importantly, are able to do some of the prototype, you know, development on their own from, you know, an initial phase, maybe not at deployment level, but they can do it to save time. Because as you know, in startups, it's all about moving at a speed where things can build and, and get traction. So from your perspective, have you had to do this yourself in, in some of the roles where, where, you've, where you've been tasked with coming in and, and building out the product or, you know, leading that next stage of their journey? Have you had to do the validation hypothesis, I guess, on a frequent basis or is that for members of the team to do? So I think when you when it comes to validating a hypothesis, there's many moving parts in this, right? Like it's, it's, it's also depends on the test that you want to run, right? So it might... Uh, this is why, for, in, for instance, growth teams that run a lot of experiments have um, people from all kinds of verticals in there, right? Because you might need somebody from marketing to 
get traffic there. You need somebody from product. You need somebody from data to analyze it. Um, so it's much harder to do, I think, as a single person. Um, I think if you're a super scrappy early stage startup that doesn't have so many people, you might need, need to do it as a single person. Um, but there is a reason, of course, why it makes sense to do this in a cross-functional team because everybody has their own fortes. Um, me, for example, sure, I could build a no-code prototype, right? I could do this. However, it would make take me a lot more time uh, yeah. than somebody who is like very trained in, for example, Figma and can do a click dummy in no time. Um, so it depends very much on the organization you work in. If I have a designer there who is able to do this much faster, I would absolutely uh, rely on their strengths, right? We all have our own strengths. Um, I can do it, but it takes me a lot of time. Amazing. And Something that I, I always like to ask leaders across the, the whole go-to-market spectrum, I guess, is really what are the key skills that are required to be a successful product manager or, you know, transitioning into a product leader role? So it depends, right? Because the, the term, the role product manager, product manager is super broad, kind of, is is, is pretty ill-defined. Um, there are all kinds of flavors of product managers. Um, I think if you look at the shopping lists that float around online of all the things that a product manager should be able to do and should be, it is pretty much insane, <laughs> right? We need to be like code writing, SQL querying, designing, psychologists, researchers, CEO of the product. We need, you know, we need all of these skills, hard skills, soft skills. We need to be analytical, but also like it's it's too broad, right? Like there's there's might be a few humans who can really tick all of these boxes, but I think most of us cannot. I certainly can't. I'm not all of these things. Um, as you have seen, as you know, I have a, a law background. Uh, I do not have a business background per se. Uh, and also I cannot code. So there's actually a lot of things I can't do. Um, so I don't think you have to be able to do all of these things, but you have to have something that you're particularly good at. Um, that's why it's also hard for me to say, like every product manager should be able to do ABC. Um, but I think what helps me a lot personally um, is, number one, the ability to kind of zoom out again and think about what it is we are doing, so not to get lost in the rabbit hole too much. It's very easy to start running with your first idea and, and have a lot of fun getting in there. And it's very easy to get lost in the nitty gritty, um, but it's, I think, a talent and also a skill and also related to experience to be able to stop yourself and think, kind of go back to first principles, right? Uh, question everything, understand what are we doing? Why are we doing this? Why is this important? Um, and, and ask those hard questions. And I think a second big part that comes with it is communication and being able to collaborate with others um, because you can't do all of this on your own. You need to bring others along with you. Um, so stakeholder communication is extremely important, um, knowing when to communicate, with whom, in which formats, being able to communicate effectively. Um, this is also a skill that you can practice, that you can train. Um, but I mean, it's really hard, right? I'm, I'm absolutely learning this every day. Um, so I can recommend anyone to, to jump on that train as quickly as possible. And just from my experience, I, I'm, I'm by no means a product expert, but from the recruitment work I've done in the past, I guess, three things across whatever industry, whatever size startup or enterprise business you work in, three key skills that I tend to find that are important for product managers or leaders is communication, as you mentioned, um, trust um, as a currency and product is important. And I guess that, that ability to be co collaborative within cross-functional teams. So those, if you have those three fundamental skills from there, you can always build on the other pieces. And you know, before we move towards the, the, the quick fire questions, I call it the fun part where I get to uncover more about each guest. Um, I, I just want to ask you then, in terms of your lessons learned, you've, you've worked with a lot of different businesses. What would you say is the biggest failures or challenges that you've personally experienced? Because it's the, the biggest failures I find that help you to learn the most, right? When, you're, when people are winning, you know, you, you take a little bit from that. But when you're losing or you've lost the battle, you, you go back to that war and you think, OK, I, I'm going to win the next battle and win the war. Right. So just want to understand more about where the biggest lessons have been for you in your 
10 year career? So I think for me, the biggest lesson um, is about starting with the target audience first, not starting with the idea um, and starting to really understand the problem first. Um, because I think I've, I've been a part of many, many startups and a lot of them failed. Some of them did not, but a lot of them failed. And the common pattern there was that we solved a problem that we thought was urgent, that we thought was important, but was not truly important to our customer. Um, so I've been mainly in B2B. That's why I'm talking more about like problem solving yeah. uh, or it, it was for us. Um, if the problem is not extremely strong or quite strong and also recurring, um, once a year is not enough. It has to come back regularly nobody's going to switch from their alternative. So if your thing is only slightly better than the alternative, they're not going to switch, or at least that's been my experience. Um, also in my experience, educating the market is very, very hard. It's probably possible, but I have never succeeded at doing it. Um, we ha I have built many tools that were just objectively better than what was out there. Uh, yet we were not able to get customers to switch because they were happy enough with the market leader leader the pain was not big enough uh, and especially if you are an early stage startup you do not have a brand you do not have anything like this um, and getting people to change habits is very very hard and um, so this is something i found an issue you can't really mitigate that well after so this is the foundation of your business and if this doesn't sit well you can spend all this time optimizing the funnel or finding a new acquisition channel or doing all of these fun, f cool, fun stuff. And you can kind of tweak and optimize and, and maybe increase by 5%, but it's never going to go big, right? It's never going to be a great product because it's simply not a necessary product. It becomes necessary if it is, as some people say, 10x better than the status quo, which I think is quite a high bar. But right, this is something to really keep in mind. and and I think a really hard thing to ask yourself critically when you are five years in or eight years in to go, okay, are we really important? Does it really need to exist, the thing that we built? Do people really care? Um, you can do this Sean Ellis uh, PMF test where you ask users, how disappointed would you be if we were, were to no longer exist? Um, right. And I think in all honesty, a lot of companies that I see, they may not pass this, even though they've been around for eight years and they're kind of surviving. Um, and maybe in this case, it's even fine. Right. But maybe that's not the business that you wanted to build. Um, so that's kind of going back to this first principle of does this software really need to exist? <laughs> I think, um, yeah, it's, it's a painful one. That is, that is the question, I guess, founders and, and executives within businesses are always trying to uncover, is this really going to solve the problem in, a, in such an impactful way that is going to cause the market to consider us as a serious player without having that branding behind the business? But just a question for me then, for, for you, is really about prioritization. And that's obviously something that's key in product management. So over time, how have you been able to develop, you know, your prioritization skills and knowing when to prioritize something over something else. Right. So I think this is also an extremely important skill, right? And this takes also just time and experience to be able to get better at this. Um, and it's something you will continue to develop throughout your career, hopefully. Um, but I think it's one of the most important things, right? To understand what you should be spending time on and what not. Um, so it's about prioritizing features or things to build, but it's also prioritizing what you need to be spending your time on and what potentially your team needs to be spending your time on. Um, so there's a variety of frameworks out there, but in the end, I would go back to the basics, right? To kind of understand, okay, who does this idea serve or who does this work potentially serve? Um, is that aligned with the target audience that we said we would serve? If not, maybe that's fine, right? But we need to um, make that visible and understand is this a conscious choice that we're now making to do this and um, and what are the parameters under which this is okay um, and also align it with our strategy right um, uh, what are we trying to achieve what are our goals what, it, what is our strategy um, and also with uh, our team's resources can we actually do this right now 
Um, we don't want to prioritize something that we can't actually do anytime soon, right? Because we want to learn quickly whether it was in fact a good idea. Um, and also I, I have this kind of rule of thumb that if there's no way to cut this down into smaller pieces and, and validate one assumption in a very quick um, and cheap way, then let's not do it, right? If the only way to address this opportunity is to build a fully fledged product over the next six months, uh, then to me, it is too risky. And I also don't believe that you can't cut it smaller, right? I really believe this is true. Um, but I think it's an important test. So I think it's uh, those three things like target audience, strategy and goals. Can I, do I have the resources to test this quickly? And do and you often find that the resources are there with these smaller businesses or you have to make some sacrifices generally, right? Well, that's the point of prioritization, right? Like you pick one thing over another usually. Um, so yes. And in terms of in the early years of your product career, how, how did you find yourself obviously working for different companies? They had different cultures, different mindsets. How did you find yourself adapting and how, how did you find over time being yourself and, you know, helped you and the organization to really gel together? rather than trying to fit into the mindset or the person that somebody else wanted you to be? So it's in the middle, right? Like I, I, am, I, I think, yeah, be yourself. But also every company is its own little society, right? Like it's made up of people and you need to figure out where you fit in this society, right? So you can't be like, like, like in a relationship, you also can't be, this is 100% me, I'm not going to change anything, right? You need yeah. to figure out how you fit in this organization and um, because sometimes you work in an organization where people are um, more reactive and less proactive and you need to pull them along a lot more and pull a lot out of them um, or you'll be in an organization where people are already very proactive and used to bringing their own ideas and have no problem getting out of their out of their shell so that requires you to be a very different kind of person right so i think it's super important to not come with this sledgehammer kind of modus of this is how I do product, um, but yeah. to take time to understand who is here, how does this society work, what is necessary, what is important, how can I fit, how can I maybe achieve a quick win together with the team to kind of win trust. Um, so be yourself, but in moderation, <laughs> I think. Great. I, I really love that. that um overview that you gave me there and all the insights you've given me on the product piece so far and as we move into the quick fire questions i'm going to ask you two or three and the first question will be um what would be your favorite type of music oh that's very hard because i like all kinds of music right i, I like all kinds of stuff so i like I, I live in berlin germany right so i've been very much in the techno scene for <laughs> for a long time so i like electronic music um but also quite specific there uh i also like um, kind of old school indie rock um, or, or old school um, rock music. So I quite like um, older bands like uh, Talking Heads or Tears for Veers or um, um, stuff like that. Um, so again, just like in my professional life, I'm not really good at sticking to my lane. I like all kinds of stuff. And in terms of your preferences for food, what would you say is your favorite type of takeaway? Oh, so firstly, I love takeaway. Um, so I like when I was um, when I wasn't a mother and not a not a partner to anybody. When I was living on my own, I did not touch a pan for about six months. It was fantastic. I just only ate takeaway. Beautiful, best time of my life. <laughs> um, but in terms, of best type of takeaway depends. I love Korean food. I love Japanese food. I love a good curry. Uh, I also love here in Berlin, you have this kind of cheap Asian, which is literally just called Asia restaurant <laughs> without <laughs> specified. And they do this kind of like breaded chicken with sweet and sour sauce and rice. It is completely dirty. Uh, I'm a big fan of that for my takeaway. Lovely. I need to visit when I next um, turn up in Berlin for a meeting. But the last question I have is, is one out of the box that I, I like to, you know, ask to my friends a lot. And who's one inspirational person that sticks to mind and, and that you always really go back to their principles or things that they've said in your day-to-day -day life? 
in my day to some, somebody I know in my day to day life? It, or, it could or be somebody some... you know, or it could be somebody you know from many years ago that have been big in society. Yeah, so I I, I really like uh, Seth Godin quite a lot, um, who's more like a known as a marketing guru, but I don't think it's just marketing at all. Um, I think um, I was recommended his book, This Is Marketing, about a year and a half ago. And when I read it, I was like, all of these things, right? Um, and for my personal life, I think I've had the luck of working for some really smart uh, leaders. Um, and this is also what I would recommend all um, starting product managers or even product managers in, in my level is to look for a mentor who can inspire you because I've had a few of those. And I think back um, I go back to the things that they told me regularly, right? So I think about this stuff a lot. Um, so one of the best pieces of advice was to um, never be the smartest, smartest person in the room. So always right, surround yeah. yourself with people that you look up to um, because you do become who you surround yourself with, right? So if you stick around in a toxic environment or an environment that isn't really great for you and you don't see a way to change it, you've tried, but it doesn't work. Um, you run the risk of being negatively impacted by that, right? So I would, uh, I was given this advice to always look for a room where you're not the smartest person. Um, and I think this was genius. Amazing. I, I've, I've heard that advice a lot as well. And I, I think it's something to follow. If you're the smartest person in, in the room, then you're probably in the wrong room because you're not learning anything, right? And challenging your mind. Yeah. So that's one thing. In terms of Seth, Seth's book that you mentioned, I guess with being a product leader, the product marketing piece can be tied into that book, right? And you would have learned a lot of little gems from that book to take away and adapt to what you're doing in the product marketing side. And just in terms of the question I have from a previous guest I want to share, which is a tradition, and then I'll ask you to share a question for the next guest. Bear in mind, it could be a sales, a product, a customer success, a pre-sales leader. So it doesn't need to be specific to product. But if it is, then that's fine as well. I'll, I'll get that question across to them. But the question I have from the last guest is, if you was given a billion dollars, would you cut off your child's finger? Controversial, no. but people will have a socially ex acceptable answer here. Exactly. So uh, firstly, that is not a controversial question to ask like this at all, because I can guarantee you that nobody on this podcast will say yes to this, uh, or I'd be highly surprised if so. So for me, of <laughs> course not. Um, however, I think it's a really cool question because it kind of shows how probably customer feedback is unreliable. Um, the better question would be, have you ever chopped off your child's finger <laughs> in return for $1 billion? Um, <laughs> think about the last time you did that. Um, but I think the issue with this is, of course, that people will always give socially acceptable answers, right? Firstly, it's crazy hypothetical. So I will never be able to give you a reliable answer. Secondly, oh, I, it's socially completely unacceptable to say yes. Um, so I think it's a really nice prime example for how customer interviews can go totally wrong. I agree. But, and, and from your perspective, if, it, do you know, depending on somebody's situation, you can never say never, but if I guess somebody if their child was of an age of 15 or 16 and they, you, you said to them, look, you're going to get a billion dollars to, to, to lose your pinky finger, they may say, here, mom, here it is. I'll take a billion for the rest of my life. I never have to work. So, you know, from the, if if depends if the child's involved and has that option to have some input into it, it could change people's answers. But as you mentioned, generally, I guess everyone would uh, refuse that offer. And what would be the question that you would like to ask the next guest on the show yeah firstly to go back to what you just said right i really don't <laughs> want to live in a world where that is the case <laughs> so i would find it highly immoral to go down that route so it's more like what kind of world do i want to live in not Agreed. that one um so thinking about my question god okay what is the worst experience with a digital product that you've ever had I'll, I'll be sure to ask that. I'm sure there'll be a range of different answers, but you can tune into episode 13 and I'm sure you'll find the answers there. But Elsa, I, I want to, from the bottom of my heart, thank you for your time. I've really enjoyed this engaging conversation, all of the humor involved as well. Um, and I look forward to checking out your podcast that will be coming out soon as well. Thank you. No problem. Enjoy the rest of your week.
You too. Bye-bye.